One of the words that immediately comes to mind, and you've used it already, Paul, is lyrical. Because particularly from this distance, when you're slightly further away from the sculpture, there are these curls and tendrils, and it feels like elements of a ship fluttering in That's the wind. Wonderful. It That's feels like true. wind which is coming along the quayside. That's but true. There is another element to this, which it's a hefty, substantial steel sculpture. And mm. Pat, I know that you were heavily involved in the process of actually fabricating this thing, getting it made. Yeah. What, what did that involve? Well, in, uh, a lot of um, metal rolling. It, when Tony worked on the one-third scale model, we got all the curves and the curvatures and things right. And then we give that to the steel company. They would roll the metal and the big box section was rolled. And then also to make it stand up out here, galvanizing. It had to be all galvanized and then painted because you get a lot of corrosion by the sea. And then Tom, you know, Tom Roberts did all the architectural bits with Tony. Mm -hmm. You know, the aluminium decking and everything was chosen for that lightness of color. And you, could, you could have had a wooden decking, but it wouldn't have worked. It had to be all about metal. Do you, I mean, forgive me for asking something that sounds so obvious, but um, all of that stuff is, once the idea is there, the form has been sort of realized. Yes. It's a question of executing the idea. Yes. How did he get to that point from the beginning? How, how, what form well, did that it, take? It, the idea for the sculpture, when he was asked by Tom Roberts to give it, uh, the idea came from the previous sculpture he had made, one of the Catalan sculptures. And Tony looked through his volumes of books and said, oh, uh, that's the one, that's, I like that. And that's the idea came. But there was only an idea, it's nothing like this. Mm -hmm. This is a development of that idea. How big was that sculpture? It's about four foot high, isn't it? And it, it, it's a quite a, a lyrical sculpture because the elements um, of the Catalan sculpture relating to this sculpture, the sort of curvy bits, and it sort of leans back. Uh, but he's, you were saying how he's really substantially changed it to get to this, to get to this point. He, he's, he was very good at simplifying and making his sculptures terse and clear. He was able to sort of chop bits out and make it stronger and stronger. And that's one of the, one of the things that um, he would tell me about. He, would sometime, he read a piece to me once that Manet wrote about how it's important as an artist to be um, sort of not to, not to say things in a complicated way, but to say them clearly and as simply as possible. Going for essentials. Going for the essentials. He said if you, you, know, if you can say things very, very crisply and clearly, it draws people attention and uh, he was very very good at that that's one of the things he was he really made an effort about He'd, I think Manny also said about being modern you know looking at the, the most modern things you know um, but he, he was he was particularly good at being that very very compressed very terse clear essential message do you think one of the beauties of that is that it then makes a work of art all the more evocative in a sense because here is an abstract sculpture in which we as viewers are invited to start speculating on the form and thinking how does it relate to this place, to pool, to the quayside. Yes. You can see a sense of a sail, you can see all of the marine qualities, the colour blue, they seem very obvious. But what about the music side of sea music? Well, I think that abstract artists are very attracted to the idea of music because they realise that you don't need an, an obvious overt uh, sort of item objects like this glass to make an artwork work or a face or something that you can label clearly it, it can you can make an artwork like a piece of abstract music if you listen to Mozart it's just notes strung together with uh, to make something amazing and abstract art is using color and shape in the same way to to, to create through unity and tension through creating kind of battle and creating kind of harmony you create something that sings. Mm -hmm. This was unveiled in 91, so it's 25 years ago now, and already at that point, that was, what, three decades after the, the breakthrough, the classic moment in Caro's career where he'd started creating painted steel sculptures, abstract works. By this point, he's thinking about this new term that I've read about called sculptecture. Pat, what, what did he mean by that? Uh, I think Tony invented that word, sculpture. Yeah. <laughs> what it meant is, is, is making art, you know, in the old days I think artists were invited to make a sculpture, 
decorate a building, and Tony didn't want that. He wanted to make something that you could get into and interact with. And his sculpture was about that, and that's what this is about, interaction. Not just a visual interaction, but a physical interaction. You walk up onto the sculpture, up onto the platforms, and you see it from different views. Mm -hmm. And by doing, by, by taking that walk, it's like walking in a museum, really, mm -hmm. seeing all the art. By taking that walk, you get to see it. And I'm, I think that he actually used that term. I mean, he was genuinely interested in architecture and its relationship to sculpture. But he did use that term initially as a joke. It was actually a sort of slightly humorous word that he, he knew it was slightly awkward. But he's in all and the it, books now. And it actually it? took off as something rather serious. But he wouldn't have, I think he would have thought of another term if he thought it had been taken seriously. It was a slightly uh, tongue in cheek, self mocking term. Well, you have but to get it in the dictionary now. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm exactly. sure it's already there. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I think abstract sculptors, you know, do look to other languages, uh, other other areas for inspiration. And you know, you could go towards jewellery, which he did at one point, or you could go towards maybe furniture, which he thought about with sculptures coming off the table. And I think architecture was an, was another area that he could explore. He could almost enter into a sculpture. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point he was talking about doing sculptures going into the ground, you know, instead of going up into the air, but actually going... He did work a couple of sculptures that do, you look into, but he, I think he would have liked to have done a big hole in the ground one day and make a sculpture that you actually sort of go down into a, a sort of cave below you. I suppose the thing that I was driving at is, for people who maybe are not so familiar with what your father achieved as an artist, where does this work sit within his wider career? Well, he recently had a, a big show up at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park and the Hepworth Wakefield Museum. And it's wonderful to see how in each decade his work evolved and changed. At the beginning, his work was very classical and formal and neat. And it had a kind of preciseness about it. It was like, they were like big classical toys almost that, that sort of modeled, they were in the world like a toy that you can kick, you know, I trip over my son's toys sometimes. They're in the world, but they're also ideas in the head, and that they, they played on that tension, the early ones. And then later, they became uh, softer and more lyrical um, and warmer. Uh, and then right at the end, in the Park Avenue series, the picture, the, the, these sort of sculptures take on a kind of a, a really a grandeur and a vastness of feeling that's sort of almost like Tolstoy or, or Beethoven. So he's going from a sort of classical Mozart-like feeling through stages to a, to, a, to a rich, very grand feeling at the end. So to what extent do you think that we should consider sea music almost as sort of middle. a pivot in that? Yes, because a, it, yes. it has this great monumentality which seems to anticipate a lot of those later projects. It's, it's, got a, it's, got a, 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 it's got a delightful lyricism, as you mentioned, and I think that it's sort of halfway, halfway through his career in a way, so you've got elements of both. It's, not, it's a really delightful sculpture, although it's very large, it doesn't bully you. This sculpture uh, seduces you, it's much softer and more delightful. Um, it, it, you warm to it the moment you see it. Do, do, do you think that, does that reflect your memories of, of your Yes, day? yes, he, was, he had um, a tremendous uh, intelligence and wit and he, he wasn't a sort of a bullying character, he would, he would, he would um, inspire you, which is part of, part of what this sculpture does. This has been here for 25 years, uh, what's actually happened to it? I mean, why, why do we need to do anything to it? Well, it's, you know, it's wear and tear, and um, it needs to be repainted, and there's quite a bit of corrosion that needs to be taken care of. I think we want this sculpture to, to stay here and be here for the next 150 years or 200 years. It goes on forever. Is it really at risk, though, if we, if we weren't to do really anything? It's really at risk, but it's looking very sort of sad, and the colour is faded, and, you know, the, the handrails are very worn from the galvanising is gone, and... It's not a, a, any great risk, but it is important to keep it. Tony always wanted his sculptures to always look like they came out of the studio the day before, and even the early 60s things. He's one of the only artists I know who will allow you to repaint his sculptures every time they go to, into a show, and they, they look like they came out of the studio yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's what he wanted, and he liked this kept 
I could keep your car, you know, clean it, polish it, not polish it, literally, but keep it clean and keep it nice, round it. Is that a hint for me? Yes. <laughs> your job. <laughs> my, my car's always covered in <laughs> sort of uh, mud, <laughs> mud from the, from the yes, cottage. Yes, I know the feeling. <laughs> um, I mean, one thing to mention is right nearby the sculpture is a wonderful pool museum. And uh, I think it's, it's very interesting. Some of those incredible sort of flint, sort of stone tools from half a million years ago, extraordinary actually. So it's rather a nice little museum just up the road from the sculpture. So mm -hmm. I think, it's, and we're going to have a nice show of the concerto series, a series of small table sculptures um, in the Pool Museum next year. And it offers one of the best views of the sculpture. It does. Not from the quayside, but approaching from the street. And I recommend people actually trying it, looking at it from different angles. But as you say, it's, that is probably my favourite view. Yeah. Which, of course, Tony did think about a lot, That's didn't right. he? I mean, it, with a great work like this, it's not about being seen from one vantage point. It has it's to be. That's right. Considered and as you go up it as well, as you go up the, the, onto the platforms. Mm -hmm. Even when he was when we were in Stormont, he was out in a boat, looking out from the seaside. Oh, really? Is that right? Yes. From a boat? Yeah. Seriously, I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, wow. Alistair from Wow. Bone Steel had a yacht wow. and he'd come over, oh, wow. pick Tony up, and they go right around the harbour. Tremendous. Come and have a look from over here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. As he always said. And he was satisfied. Right. Oh, he's very, yeah. But, it, you know, it didn't, even when the sculpture went up, we still made some changes on it on the quayside. You know, there was bits we cut off and added to. I'm amazed to hear that because it's so big. I yep. would assume that at that point, all you can do is install what you've got. No, no. Tony was never happy with that. He would always want to do the final cutting, trimming, looking from over the street, looking from down here. And would he articulate why that particular thing had to change, or was it more of an instinctive, doesn't look quite right, need to cut that? Need, that's exactly what Tony was like. You know, look at it, it's not quite right, got to fit, get it, get it right. I think that's the thing about this, in a way, isn't it? That we could sit here and analyse very carefully why it works in this particular setting. Yeah. But it does have a poetic quality, I think. You know, you've described it. Of course. And if you analyse it too much, you kill that off, don't yes, you? Yes, you would. 